Welcome to our Role Model Monday webinar of the summer with a focus today on STEM explorations in high tech, robotics, computing, semiconductors, and more. We have a fabulous lineup throughout June and July and hope you can join us weekly for panel discussions with current students, alumni, and STEM role models from our community. I'm Sojin Yoon, she or pronouns, communications intern with women in STEM within undergraduate college at the University of Texas at Austin. Today, we have Ivana Duranku helping us with the Q&A portion of our webinar. We will add all of our role model webinars to our WeSTEM YouTube channel and other videos to help future and current students. Subscribe to the channel to get notified when new videos are added. I'm gonna be throwing in the link to the chat to subscribe to our channel. So today our focus is on STEM explorations in high tech, robotics, computing, semiconductors, and more. We will have each panelist share some quick intros here in a moment to get us started. And after introductions, we'll have a facilitated panel with some pre-selected questions. And we'll also be taking questions from you. So use the Q&A area to submit your questions at any time. So I just want to get everyone introduced and do some quick introductions. So if our panelists could give their name, pronouns, hometown, their major degree, year in um, school or company, hobby or outside school activity, anything you like to do outside of school or work. If any of you guys just wanna go ahead and start. Shoot, I'll start. Uh, my name is Allison Korczynski. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. My hometown is uh, Houston, Texas, uh, specifically Katy, Texas. Uh, but I'm located now in Seattle, Washington. Uh, my major and degree uh, was electrical and computer engineering from UT uh, in 2010. Uh, I proceeded to get a master's degree afterward. Um, it's been, what, 14 years <laughs> since, uh, but I've been about uh, probably 12 years in industry. I had two years for grad school. Um, and right now I am at Amazon Kuiper, uh, making satellites, uh, that'll bring you internet, uh, and hobby outside of school is, uh, ultimate Frisbee. And when I'm not, um, working, I really love exploring the outdoors in the Pacific Northwest and doing backpacking. I can go next. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Richa Agarwal, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, uh, my major in my hometown is Rajpura, Punjab. I'm from India, the northern part. Currently, I'm based in Bay Area, specifically Santa Clara, California. Uh, my major in college was electrical and computer engineering. I finished my grad school from UT Austin in 2015 and uh, closer to about 10 to 11 years of experience working in the industry. Uh, currently, I am a silicon architect in Meta, uh, previously Facebook, hope you all know. And um, we are building the AR VR solutions. So, you know, the cooler glasses. And outside of work, I like to travel. In fact, I am just returning from an awesome July 4th trip uh, from Costa Rica. So, yeah, I'm fully energized and excited to speak to all. Uh, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm from Saratoga, California, which is right next to San Jose. If you don't know Saratoga, most people don't. Um, I studied mechanical engineering for both my bachelor's and my master's. Um, graduated in 2020 from Santa Clara University, um, but I went to NYU for undergrad. And then I work currently at Applied Materials as a um, vacuum robotics design engineer. Um, so 
that means designing the robots that move the wafers around at vacuum. We do not use a vacuum on the robot to pick up the wafers, to clarify. Um, and an out of work activity that I enjoy doing. I also like to travel a lot. I'm currently traveling right now, which is why I have like kind of a weird background. <laughs> um, but I also like to open water swim on the weekends in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area still. Um, and I also love to cook and bake and mix fun drinks. Okay, I will introduce myself. Hi, I'm Connie Wayne. Um, so I made a list, so just I don't forget the question. <laughs> My pronoun is she and her. Um, and I am, I was born and raised in Taiwan. And I've been in the U.S. for 32 years. Um, so I'm currently based in Silicon Valley, uh, work for Applied Materials. I've been in Silicon Valley, uh, this area for 32 years. I'm really much, uh, much more Cal Northern Californian than anything else. I, I, so that also made me very, uh, make, very much want to learn the culture around the U.S. as well. That's well my largest hobby right, hobby right now. Um, so my background is material science and engineering. I got my PhD from Stanford in 99. So if you do the math, you know, I've been working 25 years. <laughs> so in that 25 years, I work at AMD for 10 years in semiconductor. And AMD has a large operation uh, in Austin. I don't know the current situation, but what's the case that allowed me to uh, visit Austin a few times um, back in the days. In the last 15 years, I've been working at Applied Material in a corporate CTO office. So my job is developing new energy products like uh, for basically a material component that we can apply to the next generation battery for electric vehicle. So my interest right now is really um, want to do the full spectrum from material engineering all the way to an electric vehicle. I think ultimately that's the most exciting thing as a STEM person to understand um, so process science and all the way to the end system. So that made me uh, most excited with my work. And I have two kids and my old one is just turned 20, is a sophomore in college and I want to study medicine. My second one is uh, rising 12th grade is a very stressful time for her to uh, uh, to do the college application. But just by interacting with her last year or so, you know, as the STEM moms, we are super busy, but uh, I try to spend more time with the kids. Also, um, get me uh, more in tune with the, um, uh, the certain topic and uh, maybe the mindset of high school kids. So that's why I'm very motivated to talk to the audience today. Um, so basically, my background, other than the education, spans through semiconductor, superconductor, and energy storage. So there is an interest to develop a very long-term career. I'm also quite interested to uh, to continue the dialogue after today's event. So my hobby, when I joined Apply 15 years ago, my boss at that time said, join Apply, see the world. <laughs> it turned out to be the case. And I developed an uh, interest for travel and also doing my uh, time at Apply. So some of the cool places I got to travel to, including Morocco. Uh, also, I did quite a bit of, um, so my primary business um, uh, space is in Asia that allows me to travel to a different Asian culture as well, and as well as Europe. So those are my... Um, overall intro. Thank you. So our first question or discussion is, can you tell us a bit more about your role and the work you do in the field of high tech? What are some of your key responsibilities and projects? Do you want me to go first? Okay. All right. So um, the thing I love most about electrical engineering is it's a uh, a very generic major, which means that my role and what I do um, can apply to so many different fields and applications. Um, from uh, pretty much probably my sophomore year, I took a microcontrollers class and I learned about the intersection of hardware and software and it caused me to get into circuit board design. And um, specifically at Amazon Kuiper, I am one of the electrical um, responsible engineers for um, a, a subsystem of, of the satellite called reaction wheels, which help with attitude control of um, the satellite in space. So the roll, pitch, and yaw 
And so essentially I'm just spinning wheels and doing some motor control um, for the satellite. Um, what's awesome and really cool is that my whole career has not been in space. It's actually been a background in uh, computing. I used to be at Apple. I used to be at uh, Nest Thermostat, if you remember that. Five years at Microsoft, five years at Meta doing um, the glasses and then haptic touch gloves. And you kind of go, what the heck does that have to do with space? Um, believe it or not, all of it is so very related. This board here is in space right now, um, helping us get internet for Amazon. And it's really cool um, to see how making circuit boards and dealing with analog circuits, dealing with firmware, how it all comes together, the hardware and the software comes together to essentially make different things. I think that, um, you know, the fundamentals that you learn in STEM, math and electrical engineering, I think really do apply to so many different fields. And uh, right now I wanted to learn about motors and motor controllers and robotics. Uh, I also did a French fry maker at some point. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's really important to understand navigation in space space has some issue, um, other challenges that I haven't experienced before in other fields. And so um, my responsibilities are making sure that we're able to always steer the satellite to the antennas that are on ground on Earth. And so it's really important um, to be precise, even when you are thousands and thousands of miles away. So it's been a, a fun journey. Um, but I love circuits and circuit boards. So, yeah. Okay, I can go next. So it's very much, you know, I completely agree with Alison and I think our fields are pretty close enough. So as I mentioned, I'm a silicon architect. So we are in the field of, you know, chip design, semiconductor, you know, and uh, as Alison said that the applications are, you know, everywhere. If you think about AI, you think about AR, VR, you think about any other, you know, uh, any other space, I think the chips are everywhere, the microcontrollers and everything. So uh, coming back to what my role is, you know, and I'm a silicon architect and a chip design. There are so many things you can do. You couldn't be an architect. You could be a designer. You could be a tester. You could be in the embedded field. So I have done during the, you know, phase, uh, my career phase, I have done a little bit of everything. And right now as an architect, my responsibility is uh, to define the functional requirements, how the things integrate with other components on the circuit board that Alison just showed. So, <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of parts, right? So my, make, I have, my job is to make sure the part that I'm working on is in synergy with the rest of them. Uh, so that is my role. And the closest thing I can, you know, give an example to explain is if you have uh, seen any construction project, you know, the architect kind of, you know, relates to a civil architect. So if you see whenever there is a construction project, there is an architect that comes up with the plans, the drawings on the paper, and then that gets submitted to the city. And when the permit is there, then, you know, the, the, the general contractors actually build that out. So uh, if you just relate to that, currently my job is to create that plan and define the functionalities so that, you know, the design, it can be designed further and and, you know, the end product is a chip. Yes, I can go next. Um, so my role, I would say, is very much related to Richa and Allison's role. But instead of me doing the actual chip design, I just have to have the chips be made as fast as possible, given the requirements that they set for their chips. So that could manifest in the form of like a brand new process chamber to do a new process that they want to make this chip work faster. And so that means that my robot has to be compatible with any new um, process chemistry, meaning any new gases they want to use, any new materials they want to deposit, um, or any new chamber um, like geometry itself. Maybe they need a bigger chamber to hold more wafers to do at the same time, um, or maybe they need a 
a slightly different opening to trap a different gas. And like, they're all so different, but with the robot, we try to make them as cross compatible as possible with all the different processes that we have um, to, to a reasonable limit. Um, and then the way that I would describe like my role in chip manufacturing, just because I know, it, at least in my case in high school and even in college, I did not know what semiconductor manufacturing looked like. So the best way I can describe is that you have like a bunch of piece, pizzas that need to be built according to different recipes. And we literally call the chip making like different processes. We call them recipes like in the lab. Yeah. Um, so if you can just imagine these like flat disks moving around this tool, getting like a certain material added to it and then it moves to a different spot to have material removed from it and then that builds up your finished chip so um so yeah really the main part of my job is to make sure that we have these pizzas in this case wafers moving as fast as possible and as accurately as possible because we're working on like the nano scale now in terms of the accuracy of markers we need okay, i will go ahead so maybe you can see the background in my uh, our company's background. See what uh, Rachel was saying: uh, bunny suit and then making chip and very tiny devices actually involve many many uh, layer of nanoscale material engineering. That's what applied material is, or in our general our industry is right. Cover everything from the design of this device and then connection of those device. And then, um, and also there are different function of engineering discipline, um, like from the material engineering. So maybe I can describe my career progression. My first job was process engineers. Um, that's uh, that's the um, a, a function that if you study material science, chemical engineering, physics, um, in general. Uh, the science applied science field, you could get your first job in semiconductor as a process engineer and then learn how to run this wafer and also be able to think of material at those scale level. It's quite fascinating because you got to work with the team of uh, uh, people with uh, different uh, projects and with their expertise and creativity to solve problems. It's really fun, very one well, of the most sophisticated engineering projects you can get. Um, so I think that's the, the really good, like a first job in the semiconductor industry. And after that, of course, um, things can, can really broaden up because there is also engineer, engineering aspect and get into the hardware design or component design. Um, so for me, my career path in went into engineering management. So I got to learn uh, really a hard way, but a hard way, but now I enjoy it. It's looking back how to lead a group of guys. I think going forward, there will be a higher percentage of female engineering would be. And also I think the, uh, in the current generation and people are more and more exposed to the DEI discussion. So it'd be far easier. But I would say 10 years ago, it would not necessarily has as that it's it's more there various aspect of challenge so that's how I also become really passionate to build this peer mentorship right the mentor come from not top down but sometimes through the peers um so that was my next phase of career engineering management so the good thing is that there are always a lot of training internally or also in the um, external uh, society that you can learn about that and also I I make many many good guy friends so we are really buddy buddy. So I enjoy that aspect as well. And after that period of my career, I turned into business development. In the tech, business development is built on heavily technical, right? Because the product we sell is technology or product. So that if uh, all the business um, proposals stalled, at the end is what value business development person able to formulate for customer. So at the end, it's still based on all my uh, experience and also all my peers and also my collaboration network uh, uh, in this field. So then, and I really, really enjoy it, especially at my age group, I'm not necessarily uh, will um, work on the project hands on myself, but I really, really enjoyed the opportunity to work closely with my customers, 
teams and uh, bridging our team, customers team, even university to uh, push the uh, forefront our of current technology status quo. So that's my current job. And I'm also very excited, as I mentioned, because I wasn't trained to be a hardware person. I got to see a bit about autonomous vehicles and electric vehicle. That made me uh, so motivated to come to work every day and still putting 100% my uh, my my time. I mean, of course, I, I do want to have a work life balance, but in my work, I still keep me very motivated. So, our next question: Technology is constantly changing. What would you say inspires you or excites you about the future of STEM and high tech? Gosh, I'll go first. Um... I think that, you know, if I would have predicted, um, I, I was at UT from in 2006 to 2010. Uh, first off, I never thought I'd leave Texas my whole life. Um, I ended up going to California for computing and building computers and then going to Seattle. And I remember not really understanding like, what would I build then, you know, robot space, laptops, like AR, VR, like there are so many things, you know, even what in 2006, I didn't, I didn't even have a smartphone because they didn't exist yet. The iPhone didn't come out yet. And so I think that the future of STEM is, you know, honestly, just so rapidly changing. And it's so cool to be on this journey um, where, you know, learning new things every year, practically every day, um, I always believe to just, you know, keep learning because um, I didn't know anything about electrical engineering when I first started. And um, I learned more and more about materials and semiconductors and hardware and software and how complicated the world can get and how cool the technology is. And so what I'm most excited about in the future is, um, honestly, to see, see our progression of, uh, I think wearables, I still, I still love wearables. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, am addicted to my phone sometimes and I wish that, and I look forward to the applications of AI and the applications of wearables so that we, um, can be social and interact with the world without, being glued to our phone. Um, you know, I've been amazed at how tiny, you know, Saturday Night Live had little cell phones that they thought would be this big. And lo and behold, you know, our cell phones are touch screens. Um, I've learned that um, some of my uh, coworkers, you know, um, even just seeing the progression of the equipment that we use day to day, um, I use oscilloscopes and multimeters. I think it's just really cool to see the technology and how far um, we've even come in the 12 years I've been in industry. And so I'm really excited just to see what's next. I don't know what's next, but um, I have an open mind and uh, I think that there's lots of cool things coming. So, yeah. I can go next. Um, yeah, uh, I think on the same lines, when I started, you know, as I was growing up, I think when I think of hardware, it was the monitor, the desktop, the CPUs, right? Then the smartphones came along. And then there was biotechnology. And, you know, as I am doing my bachelor's graduation and, you know, master's and everything, uh, there are more and more things coming. There is biotechnology, there is quantum computing, there is sustainability, there is uh, AI, you know, the machine learning, there's AR, VR. So uh, I would say that STEM is, you know, a, at the frontier of all these endless possibilities. And one of the key skills that I learned and, and I think is a part of the STEM is a collaboration, coming together as a group and solving problems that are, you know, pushing the boundaries. And the second thing is problem solving. So Currently, I am at, you know, a, uh, at ARVR and the wearables division of Meta. We are trying to come up with the, you know, wearable cool glasses that can actually replace your phones, which doesn't exist yet. So we are trying to push the boundaries. 
and solve for the problems, the new problems and time trying to come up with a solution, right? So I feel like STEM um, as, a, you know, whole, it's giving you an opportunity to make a real difference and come up with all these cool solutions. And, you know, even in the sustainability is something that I'm learning that there are so many cool uh, innovations happening to, you know, so yeah, I think the the possibilities are endless and I'm very excited about the future of STEM in general. Um, so I was in high school from 2010 to 2014, which I feel like was very much when the smartphones really took over. And something that I feel like I've been noticing with my generation and then the generation like immediately after is that as these newer tech becomes accessible to the younger generation, middle schoolers, high schoolers, when they go to college, they're already ahead of where we, where I was when I was in college. And I was already ahead of like the previous generation where they were just because of the tech that was accessible. So kind of what excites me is how these like newer generations, like what they choose to study, how they choose to apply it and how they choose to advance, like what we're already advancing. Um, I found I find the examples of um, like wearables a really great example of something that was attempted to be done in the mid 2000s to late 2000s, um, like up to 2010. Like, I don't know if you guys remember Google Glasses, um, but they tried real hard to make that a thing and it just didn't quite hit, I think, the target audience. But now we're at a point where people are kind of asking for it in different forms. So I also find that to be like really interesting right now where we're like very much returning back to all these concepts that we thought were great like 10 years ago, but refining it into something that is a little more applicable to everyone, the everyday user. Okay, <laughs> so I like to ask, um, I think the, of course, it's very important uh, during the school time to build out your fundamentals. And then first, pretty much first five years in your first job is to the practical training, right? Do different projects in your skill set. Those are your fundamentals. There's absolutely no shortcut of that. Um, I just think that since 10 15 years ago, when I was still relatively earlier in my career, um, or maybe 15, 20 years ago, at that time, the spectrum of skill set influenced my job function was process versus hardware. Process, as I mentioned, people graduate with material science, chemical engineering type of background. And hardware means the electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, like general. Uh, that was it 15, 20 years ago. But now it's become like software and hardware. Hardware has two components, right? Process and the mechanical, right? But now software become integral part of your skill set. Even right now, I we have start seeing that the top university, especially in those uh, really developed like a uh, high tech leading countries like Korea and others, their students will require some certain level of uh, minor, even for the material science background, have a minor in ma uh, machine learning, AI. So just, uh, so things are different now. <laughs> I'm happy that I, uh, but I, I'm if I'm 15 years younger, I would definitely try to boost my software skill. I, I think it's a must. So that's from the skill set perspective going forward, 20, 30 years down the road when you're in your mid of career, Right, that's you have to equip with this uh, combination of skills. In terms of big problems, right? So, uh, ten years ago, the reason I went switch from semiconductor to more energy storage field, um, and also at that time was onset of twenty thirty five, there would be a a big percentage of electric vehicle adoptions. At that time, was onset of the idea, but I decided to took a risk on my career to give that direction a try. But now nobody questioned about that, right? There is sizable percentage of market share electric vehicle, depending on which region, you know, some country are very high. And at least in the US, it's already around 30% of new vehicles sold, which is very significant. So 2035 goal to have a significant electric vehicle is no longer, um, Problem. So this large, large um, direction, right? But at that time, we also see autonomous driving vehicle, share vehicle, right? So that shape a uh, career it choice that which big direction you may go. But for your time horizon, you should be looking at 2050, even 2100, right? 
So what was the large problem, would be the large problem for the world? 2050 is a carbon neutral, right? With AI being a necessity of uh, technology advancement, we'll add even further requirement. What are the fundamental technology in every aspect? If you work on material engineering, what the new material? What kind of system, how can, how can we, I mean, as a whole design chip more efficiently, maybe quantum computing in a hybrid quantum versus classic computing, and how robot will change the future healthcare, right? So 2050, in the 2100, we know that Earth is still in a trajectory have a more than three degree temperature rise, which is significant disruption for a human race at that point. I will be gone long time, long term, but I told my daughter she will be 93, she still need to care. <laughs> if she ever want to have a kid, she need to care. Then but she assured me that the future, the innovation is not linear. So that's betting on AI machine learning. So the hope is really in your generation, right? Just entering the STEM training to learn the skills that are different from what my generation learned or the, or, the, or the panelists you have seen today learn, to learn something, to do something we cannot do ourselves to really change that trajectory in the future. That's my, <laughs> my hope to uh, see um, that that I, I think the future is full of hope and with a lot of those new tools come coming online. So as we approach our last question, I just want to say to our attendees, if you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to drop them in the Q and A. And so our last question is: So I know we kind of discussed a little bit about our career paths, but can you share a little bit more about how you chose your major, how you? got into your current position? And do you have any recommendations or advice for current or future STEM students? Okay, I can go first this time. <laughs> Give Alison a break. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll start by why I chose electrical and computer engineering. So I think at that point, um, the wireless communication was a reach, the cell phones, the 2G network. And I was really intrigued and wanted to learn and how all of this is happening. It was a magic to me. So that drove me to take, you know, in electrical and communication engineering as a major and for my undergrad. Uh, I think it was sophomore year where, you know, I had a subject on wireless communications and, uh, you know, it explained everything. And then I was like, okay. Uh, that's it you know so it was kind of a magic exposure effect and i was like okay uh this is it i am no longer interested in this anymore so what else is there what am i gonna do so one thing i would say is as allison was previously alluding to one learning here was that there are endless opportunities in stem even though I changed my mind midway i still had so many options in front of me and i continued that path so I finished my four years, you know, I took all the uh, subjects and there were electives, you know, you can take. Um, so I kind of like stuck to it. And then after my undergrad, I got it. I did not know like what I wanted because I changed my mind. So uh, I got a job at a Texas, Texas Instruments back in India. And fortunately, um, you know, I went there with an open mind and it was kind of a rotation kind of a role. And they were always like, hey, we need this person in this team. Uh, are you OK to volunteer some of your time to this work and that work? Right. So I was uh, have an open mind is my another, you know, recommendation. Uh, I worked with a lot of teams and was acquainted with the entire chip design flow that I mentioned, the architecture, the design, the verification, the embedding, the software part of it, everything. And kind of, you know, that helped me give an exposure of what I really wanted to do. And I realized that I wanted to be at the front end. I wanted to do more on the architecture work. So that was one thing that helped me keeping an open mind in the beginning of my career and exploring things as they come to me. Uh, the second thing would be understanding your gaps. So as I knew what I wanted to do uh, and what it requires me to do, uh, I recognized that I had some gaps in my knowledge. And uh, that's why I pursued master's and I came to UT Austin to call the courses that were relevant and kind of address those gaps and work towards what profile or what work I wanted to do. So and then I got a job at Oracle, uh, you know, as a design engineer, not exactly what I wanted, but still towards the path of where I wanted to go. 
and be very open about learning. And one thing I would mention on the journey is there were subjects which I did not like at all. There were like, you know, some analog devices. There were things like that, which I did not enjoy at all. A topic like I really wanted to get rid of. Uh, on that note, I would, you know, uh, give you an advice that don't let that deter you or develop a disinterest in the field, you know. It's not that every course or every topic or every uh, concept that you learn, you will have to, you know, it will stick with you. So, you know, for example, I did not like analog devices. That was not my strength. So it just means that I went to digital. So, you know, you find your strengths and... Um, uh, don't let that one topic kind of make you feel disinterested in the field or change your mind kind of a thing. Um, after my master's, uh, after my article, I worked on the CPU uh, design, the, you know, the front end part of the central processing units. It was very interesting, a lot of learnings there. And then I worked at Samsung. And um, I, I would say that after a couple of years, I wanted to do something different. So don't be afraid of the risks and, you know, learning something new. I wanted to, you know, go outside of uh, CPUs and learn more on the, you know, on the SOC side, on new solutions. So that's when I joined Meta, the ARVR division. And uh, that was something new. Um, I was a little bit afraid. And I think the last learning, I, I, last recommendation I would give you is that, Imposter syndrome is real, uh, where you feel like, you know, you are not capable enough or you're not good enough for this job or you might not have the experience. That's what I felt when I joined Meta. So I would say that uh, rely on your network, stay connected, right? Focus on the learnings and be kind to yourself. So all of this will help you get where you want, where you want to go and actually enjoy the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, sorry for the long answer, but yeah, I wanted to, you know, cover everything. I'll go second, yay, okay. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I chose my major mostly because it had the most math classes at UT, I said, okay, what's the most math classes? What's the least amount of chemistry? I didn't learn my appreciation for chemistry and material science, honestly, until uh, undergrad. And at the time, uh, you know, in high school, I really just loved calculus. And I was like, oh my goodness, how can I do calculus in my life? And um, that's honestly how I chose electrical engineering. And what's really helped me stay in electrical engineering and get to where I am is enjoying this intersection of hardware and software. Um, I really loved the women engineering program. I think there were so many support, um, supportive things. I stayed in, uh, oh goodness, what was the, the uh, women's uh, dorm room? I like went to all the, you know, who doesn't love free food? But uh, I really think that everyone wants uh, women in engineering to succeed. And um, I will never forget my freshman class in electrical engineering where um, my professor, Dr. Pat, I don't know if he still teaches, you know, said, hey, you know, there's a lot of people who have done computers, you know, be learning. Don't think you're a hotshot because the people who have never touched a computer before or who are new, um, they may not do so well. And I think what really that helped me understand was more so just be open. Like, it's okay, you can learn new things at any time. Um, you know, I don't know if you've heard the book about 10,000 hours, that is one thing. And I do believe that, you know, my two piece of, pieces of advice are, or maybe three, are um, for me throughout electrical engineering, you know, it really stood between me going between hardware and software. And my whole career has really been that. You know, undergrad, I focused on software, more embedded systems and firmware. Then grad school, I switched to analog circuit design. And then I said, man, I like being more hands-on. And then I switched back into more hardware and electrical. And it's really cool because what's led me now is, okay, instead of designing for stuff that's really tiny, now I design um, stuff that's actually pretty big. And it's different problems and what helped me pick my career and pick my choices in jobs is honestly me saying, 
what do I want to learn next? You know, I don't know everything and I want to get better. Um, so I do think it's really important. You know, the one thing I did maybe stick to roots is like fundamentals, being open, you know, kind of picking a category to start with, with those fundamentals to get better at. And the second piece of advice is really just make your tea. Deep dive in something, build those fundamentals, build it and deep dive, get detailed in that and build the rest of it. The tea is your breath. It's okay to be, have a lot of, gener uh, be a generalist and it's okay to deep dive. I do think it's worth it being both. Um, and that really goes to the third piece of advice is it's okay to be well-rounded. I was in Longhorn Band in college. I did Camp Texas. In addition to engineering, I think it's really important. There are so many more skills in addition to STEM um, that really apply. And so, you know, your STEM skills super duper matter and so do your communication skills. So does everything else. And I really think, you know, I love STEM. And I think that it's important to remind yourself that you can still do all the things you want to do um, outside of STEM too. So, yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay, I'll go next. Um, so I chose mechanical because I knew from a very young age I wanted mechanical. I just always loved building things. And in high school, I was on the robotics team as well. So that made it very easy in choosing a major. But then mechanical is a very, very broad major. You can cover like anything from thermo and uh, heat transfer to fluids to structures and dynamics. So I always focus more on the structures and dynamics aspect of mechanical just because I found it more interesting to me. And so in undergrad, did a bunch of projects. I was engineering a uh, co-captain of my school's Baja SAE team, which is like an off-roading um, buggy project. And then I was also working as a TA for both the makerspace and for the general engineering department, um, which is a little more like rapid prototyping and teaching freshman year students, the fundamentals of engineering, um, which I find to be like really, really important. It's a class that was mandatory for any engineering major, uh, but that just goes to show that like any engineer, we really have the common basis of like figuring out what, like how do you figure out what exactly you're trying to build? How do you make those requirements? And then that really is something that carries with you through the rest of your career. Um, coming out of undergrad, I went straight to grad school, um, but instead of continuing with the focus on like machine design, um, I pivoted to robotics and mechatronic systems as my concentration. Um, so I worked in a robotics lab for two years, um, developing water samplers that used to shape memory alloys as sensors. So that means it's a fully mechanical system. There are no electronics on board that specific system, um, but it was a very fun like material science meets uh, mechatronic sort of project. And then um, at Santa Clara, that's how I got recruited into Applied Materials, as many um, AMAP people do get recruited from there in San Jose State. Um, but with the like the heavy machine design background I had in undergrad, plus the robotics background I got from grad school, um, I got recruited into what's called the factory interface team at Applied. So that's designing the front half of the tool and it's just structures. And then about eight months ago, I switched to designing robots because I wanted to design things that moved instead of things that didn't move. Um, in terms of advice for current STEM students right now, um, I really liked what Allison said about like doing things outside of engineering. Um, that could be a hobby. Um, I didn't get to do this in undergrad, but in high school and grad school, I played music outside of classes. So drummer in high school, bassist in grad school. <laughs> um, and it's just a nice, like, it gives your brain a break from always being in this analytical mindset. And then sometimes that's what you need to come back to a project as well. At least that's what I found in my case. And I also really, really recommend um, taking some humanities classes. Like public speaking was a class that I took in undergrad. And I found that to be a super helpful course um, in terms of creating presentations, creating an argument. And you would think you don't really have to do argumentative public speaking and engineering, but you kind of do. You have to prove that your design works, right? So um, that's something that I would very much recommend for people. And also if 
taking cross school courses interests you. Like I took a course at the business school at NYU. I took a course with um, College of Arts and Sciences on psychology, like human psychology. Like I think that those are also really great in creating a well-rounded um, student and engineer. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a very good point. I think the networking aspect, I say that was also drawn from actual curricular experience in undergrad. Otherwise, all of a sudden switching from like a technical person to what's something I was aspired to do business. Uh, one thing I was able to build on was my club activity. At least I feel somewhat confident to network with people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in turn, why did I choose material science? And uh, material science wasn't a popular major those days, 20 something years ago. Well, actually more than that. Um, so my interest was that I was very, very passionate about physics when I was in high school. But I also know 100% I'm not going to be a physicist. So the closest to applying physics to an industry field was material science. So I might make that decision those days. So I really enjoyed it. Um, and then also in my thesis, I work on scene film process that also become uh, one very useful overarching uh, uh, skill set that uh, allow me to um, got in AMD. Because even though in my thesis, I work on superconductor, uh, but because my scene film uh, capability, uh, AMD was able to hire me. And also those days, uh, Sanford had a really strong set of semiconductor class. I finished all the semiconductor training class and then combined with my scene film process that allowed me to get my, my job. And at those time, I somehow, when I graduated, I had a very clear a picture in my head. I want to go into the most sophisticated industry. <laughs> That was semiconductor industry and still semiconductor industry at, in terms of uh, processing science. So that's how my uh, career was started. And in terms of uh, progression, I also uh, known to switch uh, quite a bit field and also um, a function at apply. So I was uh, always uh, often asked to talk to employee research group, uh, resource group, and especially women or Asian, like how do you switch field, especially there are more perceived ceiling. So my uh, thing is I always uh, true to yourself, you are who you are, right? You cannot pretend to be somebody else. Um, and I, I didn't, I like trying new things, um, that's my uh, true to myself. So I always also uh, fast, uh, facing uh, how do I facilitate change? So that what within my control is that I love innovation. So actually I have over a hundred granted patent. And when I told people, people were like kind of shocked. And then 2023, I was a top 10 woman innovator at applied material. My boss was shocking. You are a business development person. How can you be a top 10 woman innovator? I said, well, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And then uh, early this year, as I mentioned that, even though I, I start fully recognize this in the future, it has to have a, a both software and hardware skill set. I have very basic uh, software skill and it's hard for me to advance anymore anyway, but from the product and then product business development side I could contribute. So I joined Applied, um, my company-wide uh, product and business development training for uh, for software. So I was one of the finalists earlier this year. I think all these are true to myself, allow me to fight for position and project I want to do. And of course I had to deliver result. So I think, uh, again, start with what you're truly passionate about and then finding the angle that allow you to do the job that you uh, would like to do. And once you go from there, just continue to be true to yourself and then find your strengths and your voice. Not afraid, but always have a mentor and friends. Um, I would say that's the way to uh, to continue in, in a very long uh, career path in the tech industry. All right, thank you guys so much for your responses. They were so good. Um, now we're gonna open it up to the Q&A section. And since we are running a little bit out of time, we'll go ahead and answer two questions that are kind of similar and we'll have one to two of you guys answer it. So the question here I have is, how has AI, AI impacted your work? If so, how? And how important do you think it is to have a minor in AI or in robotics for those going into college in the next two to three years? Let's 
So okay. That's cool. oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, definitely, I think AI as a field is ever evolving. We have language models, and uh, right now, like you know meta is doing a lot of work in terms of coming out with new language models like llama so i would always suggest that if you have an option of choosing an elective then definitely be acquainted be you know it will be always useful to acquaint yourself with the concepts and once you learn about it you will see a lot of the basics of ai are built upon maths there is differentiation there is a negative feedback loop and a lot of things so it will build upon the concepts that you are already learning in some of your other courses that you are taking and specifically in my field in terms of chip design uh, even if it's not like you know it's driving the requirements uh, so that we are making sure that the hardware that we are building is you know can support all of these new use cases that are coming up in terms of chat GPT or like in terms of Llama 3 or any of the new language models that are coming up so if not directly it definitely is driving some of the requirements and defining that what kind of workloads that are hardware is designed to be built for so that's what i would say and i have um in in terms of the minor in ai robotics or just minors in general um they are great in that they show that you took courses in these specific fields but in terms of like if the goal is to get into those fields after you graduate, finding projects on campus that specialize in AI and robotics will carry you much further than just having the minor on your degree. Yeah, to echo um, Rachel's point, for sure. I think practical capstone classes, like one of the reasons I went to grad school was honestly to do more capstone classes. I think industry teaches you one thing in a certain area and that's amazing. But gosh, the opportunity, if I could be in school forever, I would because of those practical applications, those school projects, you know, being late in lab, having to work with others. I think that the more you challenge yourself to um, be hands on, solve those hard problems in robotics specifically, like try a startup, don't try a startup, try a big company, try a small company. I really think that getting that breadth of understanding what you like and don't like, but minoring in robotics to me, it only means certain things. If it is something that, you know, exposes you to a lot of different capstone projects, because robotics and AI to me is a very generic term. I was at a robotics French fry making company and we tossed out AI so much as a buzzword, buzzword. And to me, I didn't really think it was super as relevant, I think AI can be very relevant, but I think you have, you know, understanding it and the fundamentals, meaning like what, how does AI work? How do you even build an AI from scratch? Solving that question and understanding what classes or experiences will expose you to building your own AI, that I think is what's crucial rather than just saying, hey, our class gave us an AI and I just programmed a chip. That's great, but um, challenge yourself to be hands-on, especially in this time. Yeah, I, I also, I yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, I would say, for example, I did mention that software wasn't my uh, interest, but um, when I was in grad school, I also realized that I need to know something about software. So I actually, I, I, I went to take a freshman C programming class and, but my point is I want to learn. I don't need to like throw myself to a topic that I'm not really that good, but I really enjoyed that computer science class. I really changed my mindset. So fast forward now, right? If you, if uh, you naturally very good at software, AI stuff and go, go do it. But if not, you definitely should find opportunity, even application century or just, well, the basic class you find you can manage. The key is to get the concept. And you might change your opinion forever. A few years later, you can take more advanced class. But it should definitely, I would say, AI will change in the future. It's still early on. We don't know how AI will evolve. But right now, it seems a large uh, language recognition project and image recognition. But that's already uh, start shaping, um, 
shipping everything, like even manufacturing. So like smart manufacturing and how do you manage those massive number of amount of data and people come up with, uh, startup come up with very innovative uh, AI based product. You don't want to, definitely don't want to miss that kind of uh, a big direction in the future. So based on your own interests and the technical um, ability to handle AI, uh, to but definitely try um, try to get yourself familiar with it. All right, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you all uh, coming and taking the time out of your day to come to this webinar. I know we had a, quite a bit of questions in the Q and A about what specifically UT does for women in STEM and their programs for undergrads. So I'm gonna go ahead and put some links in the chat where everyone can go ahead and research those. But other than that, thanks again for joining today and thank you to our fabulous panelists. We look forward to seeing you all at our next Role Model Monday webinar next Friday focused on STEM and energy and environmental sustainability speed networking. Watch your email and our social media links for uh, links and details. And that's it. Thank you guys so much again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.